Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship service. Let us all be glad as we you know, resume our physical gathering and together with those who are joining us online, let us enter the house of the Lord and worship Him. We will be celebrating Holy Communion uh, after the sermon. So for those who are worshiping with us online, uh, please get ready the elements for the communion, which can simply be uh, juice and bread or biscuit. So let us now in silence prepare our hearts uh, to worship God. call to worship this morning is taken from Psalms 28, verses 6 to 7. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. Let us pray. Father God, our sovereign Lord, almighty God. We praise you because you have heard us when we called out for you to help us. You, O oh Lord, makes us strong and protects us like a shield. We trust in you and you help us. We are glad and from our inner being, we praise you as we sing to you this morning. So help us now as we come before you in worship Take pleasure in our adoration. Fill us with your spirit so that we can indeed worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Let us now invite the worship team to come and lead us in worship. Morning. Good morning. Nice to see a few more faces in the sanctuary. It would be nice when it fills up further and more people feel comfortable coming back. I'm going to ask you to rise with us this morning as we worship the Lord together. Say to those who are fearful hearted, do not be afraid. The Lord your God is strong with his mighty heart when you call on his name. He will come and save. He will come and save. surely come, he will come and save Again, he will 
In the sight of the Lord, in the sight of the Lord, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up higher and higher, and he shall lift you up. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord.
All right, uh, let us get back uh, to worship. Okay. Let us continue our worship through our tithes and offering. The protocol will still remain unchanged, but do stay tuned, you know, as we work towards the fiscal collection of offering. For the offering today, Please put your offering uh, in the envelope uh, provided 
and drop it off into the offering box over there as you leave the sanctuary through the side door. For those who are, uh, we, we have a new feature that you can actually do uh, e-transfer, interact e-transfer. So do take note of that service. And if you are using that service, uh, you can do so after uh, this morning's service. Listen now to Hebrews 13, 15 to 16 as we present our offering to God. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Let us pray. Father God, as we come before you to present our offering, please accept it as our sacrifice of praise. May it be pleasing to you and be used for the furtherance of your kingdom on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I refer you to the church bulletin for the announcement. First of all, as usual, a warmest welcome to all of you who are worshipping with us uh, this morning, both uh, online and in person. You can uh, pick up uh, 2023, year 2023 church uh, calendar today. Uh, quantity uh, are limited, so one per family only. If there are remaining copies, uh, remaining copies after two weeks, uh, you are welcome to pick up extra copies of that. Uh, item three, uh, Elders Board has reassessed the ongoing needs uh, of live streaming of Sunday services. As health restrictions have been lifted, uh, uh, you all are encouraged to attend uh, in-person Sunday worship. Live streaming of the services will no longer be available after the end of uh, December. Okay. Sorry? Oh, um, no, the live streaming. That means if you're you're coming in person, then it's okay. Yeah, you cannot watch it over the computer. I mean, you no longer stream the services. That's what it means. Okay, uh, there is still time for us to for you to pick up uh, and and pack a Christmas uh, shoe boxes. As you can see over there, uh, some boxes are already in. So uh, do take note. Uh, you can pick up a shoe box and pack it and return to the church by November the 13th. Please also enclose uh, $10 per box to cover the shipping charges. Uh, item 5, the mission department is planning the community service outreach during the Mission Awareness Month in March uh, next year. Uh, purpose is to provide free services to the church community and the Chinese community as a uh, salt and light. So if you have the burden to serve in any of those capacity uh, listed there, you are most welcome. And any new ideas are welcome as well. Do contact uh, the mission department at missionvictoriacac.ca. Uh, okay. uh, item six, I have already mentioned that. Uh, if you need hard copies of the instruction of how to do the interact e-transfer, uh, you can pick up a copy uh, at the foyer. Next, the upcoming baptism will be held on December the 18th. The deadline for registration is November the 20th. Okay. If you want to receive bapti baptism and has completed the uh, baptism class, please contact uh, Pastor Feng or one of the elders. Okay. Our daily uh, Bible reading program is now on the first book of uh, Timothy uh, this coming uh, Monday, this morrow. Right? Do take note and join us in this uh, Bible reading campaign. <coughs> Today's topic is overcoming temptation. 
Okay, I have put up this slide as the title. I have an alternate slide as well, and see which one you like. Okay, <laughs> right. Muhammad Ali once said that he had come up with a way to resist temptation. Wherever he went, he always carried a small box of uh, a small matchbox. He said, whenever I go to a party and I'm tempted by a beautiful woman, I simply pull out one match stick and strike it, he said. Then I put it out with my fingers, you know, and uh, remind myself, hell is a lot hotter than this. A husband confessed in Reader's Digest about a time when he and his wife were out shopping. A shapely young woman in a short skirt walked by and the husband's eyes, you know, uh, followed. Without looking up from the item she was examining in the store, the wife said, was it worth the trouble you are in? Of course, hinting that there will be a punishment, you know, later for him. Yielding to temptation brings nothing but trouble. And it is never worth the price one must pay for allowing temptation to become your normal behavior. We need to learn how to handle temptation, or temptation will handle us. Of course, overcoming temptation requires more than learning or training. This morning, we will learn from James as he gives us a strategy for overcoming the deadly lure of temptation. Let us now read of today's passage in James 1, 13 to 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when he has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The word of the Lord. Now, in order to overcome temptation, James says that we must recognize its source. We must recognize its force, and we must recognize its cause. First, in order to overcome temptation, we must recognize its source. The word tempted in verses 13 to 14 it's the same Greek word that is translated as trial in verses 2, uh, sorry, in, in verses 2 and 12. Okay. There are obviously two senses of meaning in the Greek word. When in a trial, the nature or character of a person or something is learned by submitting that person or thing to thorough and extensive testing. However, in a temptation, there is an endeavor or attempt to cause someone to sin. Note the difference. In a trial, God tests or tries the faith of Christian, but he does not tempt anyone to sin. God tested Abraham by asking him to sacrifice his son Isaac, and he tested Job by allowing Satan to afflict him with all of his trials. God tests people to reveal their respective characters. The purpose of his test is to refine their faith like gold or silver. But because of indwelling sin and the existence of Satan, every test may also become a temptation to sin. Thus, it is important to recognize that temptation never comes from God. If temptation never comes from God, then we cannot blame God 
for tempting us. Ever since Adam and Eve fell into sin, fallen human nature has been prone to shift the blame for our own evil deeds. When God confronted Adam, he shifted the blame, saying, the woman whom you gave me, you know, uh, gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. When God confronted Eve, she also blamed someone else. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Both of what Adam and Eve said are technically true, but they dodge personal responsibility for their sin. In actual fact, they blame God for tempting them. James wants us to see that if we go down that route, we will not overcome temptation, but instead call into question the holy character of God. It is easy to blame God for our own sin. We can even quote some Bible verses or theology to back up our case. We begin to rationalize, saying, God is sovereign over all things, so he has to be sovereign even over my sin. If he predestined everything before the foundation of the world, how could I escape, you know, from doing it? Besides, he promises to work all things together for our good. So he could have stopped me, you know, if he wants. But he didn't. What could I do? It wasn't my fault. You see, that is blame shifting. God calls this way of reasoning wrong and sinful blame shifting. He says, God cannot be tempted by evil. It is impossible because of God's holy nature. God cannot tempt. 1 John 1.5 tells us that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Since God cannot be tempted by evil, it follows that he himself tempts no one. God himself tempts no one. If we want to overcome temptation, we must at the outset remove from our minds all shifting of blame especially blaming God, and begin to recognize that temptation comes from our own sinful desires. Now at this point of time, James does not mention that the devil is the source of temptation, but he will later on. Here James wants us to see that to blame God or circumstances or the devil or some other people for our sin is basically to dodge its real source. To label it as a disease or sickness that we cannot control is to absorb ourselves from responsibility. There is no way we can overcome it unless we acknowledge that it comes from our own sinful desires. On the other hand, we can be victorious in overcoming the temptation when we, when we begin to recognize and be on guard against the sinful desires that reside within us. Sometimes these desires may be legitimate, but most of the times they are sinful. Whether they are legitimate or sinful would depend on the situation and how we handle it. For example, Hunger is a legitimate desire. But if it tempts us to steal, to satisfy our hunger, we sin. God created us with a desire for sex, for, a, for another example. But if we seek to fulfill that desire outside of the commitment of marriage, we sin. Some teach that salvation will destroy completely the old sinful nature. For example, Romans 6.6 6 tells us that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin 
might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that if anyone is in Christ, it is a new creation that always passed away. Behold, the new has come. But most who teach that the old nature is eradicated will still admit that we have to fight our sinful desires. But in that case, are they not admitting that those, de those desires still exist within us Christians? And it is those desires that tempt us towards sin. To deny that these desires exist is not the way to overcome them. Paul is making a distinction between our position in Christ, that is our status in Christ, and our practice in daily Christian living. Our position is that we died to our sin and are now risen and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. But in practice or in earthly reality, we still experience and we, stu we still must resist and fight those powerful desires towards sin that reside you know, within us. The way to overcome temptation, according to Romans 6.11, is to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, this is not a game that we play in our mind. It is not a, a, a mind game here, see, telling us or psychoing us, you know, uh, uh, that we really do not feel the evil desire. So we bluff ourselves into thinking that. Rather, Paul is telling us to recognize that the power of those wrong desires in controlling us has been broken by virtue of our, of our belief and union in Jesus Christ. And we must count that truth and must act on it. Acting on the truth of our new position, the power of sin will be broken. To overcome temptation, it is important to realize that although the initial thought to sin stems from our sinful desires, it is not sin unless we pursue it. For example, if we guys, sorry guys, I'm taking you as an example because I know guys <laughs> much more than, than, than women, right? So <laughs> sorry. If we guys happen to see a picture of a seductive, seductive woman on the website, the, the thought will probably, you know, pop into our mind. Wow, she is quite a woman. Yeah. Right there, we face a critical decision. Will I go further? Entertaining, you know, that sinful thoughts of what it might be like, you know, to have sex with such a woman? Or will I turn from temptation and put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no pro provision for the fl flesh to gratify its desire. It is a decision for us to make. Sin always begins in the mind. No one ever falls into adultery without first entertaining it you know, in his or her mind. If we judge these sinful thoughts, the instant they pop out in our mind, we will not go down the path towards outwardly sinful behavior. But if we do entertain such sinful thoughts, sooner or later, Satan will present the outward opportunity to sin and we will fall. So if we make it our habit to take every thought captive to obey Christ, we will not sin in thought or deed. So for James and for all of us, 
in order to overcome our temptation, we must recognize its source. It does not come from God. It comes from our own sinful desires. That's our first point. Now the second point. In order to overcome temptation, we must recognize its force. Children are often forewarned not to play with dangerous things like fire or sharp objects because they have a powerful destructive force. James in verse 14 warns us about three ways, three ways, you know, that temptation is powerfully destructive. First, the force of, tempta of temptation is that it dwells within our hearts. Temptation is not an outside enemy, but one that lives within us. Indwelling sin lurks there, you know, until the day we die and go to be with Jesus. Jesus sorry, John tells us in 1 John 2, 15 to 16, that we have to be careful of three things in the world. The desire of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. But can temptation have its force in an old person, for example, who lived who live past his age for any interest in sex? I leave that for you to answer yourself. But can temptation has its force in a blind person who cannot behold the attractiveness of the outside world? Can, a, you know, can temptation have its force in a very successful rich person in gaining more fame or in gaining more money? But the short answer is, or rather the quick answer is yes, because temptation lives within us. Many years ago, there was a blind man who was regularly attending the worship services in the church I was growing up uh, in Singapore. He used to request assistance from sisters in the church and learning to be compassionate, many sisters had agreed, you know, to let him hold and take their hands, guiding him up the slope, you know, to the sanctuary. Some of the brothers were concerned about this, but eventually dismissed the whole issue, thinking that what else, you know, could a blind man do? Sure enough, later on, those sisters who assisted the blind man were complaining against his caressing touch and stroke just on their hands. You, know. you see, temptation can still arouse the desire of a blind man. Charles Simeon, a Baptist expositor, uses the analogy that we are carrying about within ourselves much inflammable material. If you are not careful, temptation can strike the spark that causes an explosion. James' intention, according to John Calvin, is to teach us that there is in us the root of our own destruction. If we, if we ignore the danger within, or think that it has been eradicated, we are in the most dangerous and unsafe position. Second, the force of temptation is that it has a powerful and deceptive element. James in verse 14 says that each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The two words in English, lure and entice, are used together to describe the powerful and deceptive element in temptation. The first word 
describe a strong force in pulling or dragging or carrying away of its victim. The second word describes the deceptive element that masks the ugliness or danger underneath it. It may be translated as to make sinning look attractive or to make sin taste good. Think about it. Clearly, these two words are taken from the metaphor of fishing and hunting. The fish, for example, sees the bait and it lures him toward it, thinking that he will get the delicious meal. Instead, he gets hooked and carried away forcefully when he eventually becomes the meal you know, himself. The temptation to sin is like that. We think that sin will satisfy us and get us something good that we are missing. But instead, it hooks us and drags us to destruction. This metaphor of fishing or hunting is frequently transferred to the seduction of the prostitute, uh, that is, Madam Foley, uh, in the book of Proverbs. For example, in Proverbs, um, oops, I don't have that slide. Sorry. In Proverbs uh, chapter seven, verses twenty-one to twenty-seven, uh, let me just summarize for you that with her, that is referring to the prostitute. With her, many persuasions she entices him, and with her flattering lips she seduces him. Suddenly, he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool, until an arrow pierces through his liver. As a bird hastens to the snare, so he does not know that it will cost him his life. Proverbs 7, verse 26 to 27 concludes, For many are the victims she has cast down, and numerous are all her slain. Her house is the way to Sheol, descending to the chambers of death. As Christian, we are not to live by our feelings you know, or external senses without discernment of its danger, but by faith and obedience based on the knowledge of God's word of truth. In this way, we can prevent temptation from luring and enticing us from the safety of self-restraint to sin. Third, the force of temptation is that it has a life of its own. James pictures evil desire and sin as having the ability to conceive and give birth. See, when an evil desire conceives, we need to abort it as soon as we can. We have all seen a tree growing out of a sidewalk where it has split the concrete. It began as a tiny seed falling into a crack. But that seed had life in it. And the power of that life produced a tree that broke up the sidewalk. Temptation has that kind of destructive life in it. Do not let it take root in your life. Follow the example you know, of Joseph who ran away from the wife of his master, uh, Potiphar but not the example of David, King David, sorry, King David, right, uh, who allowed his desire to take root and eventually led him to adultery and murder. In order to overcome temptation, we must first recognize its source, that is, you know, our own sinful desire. Then we must recognize its force, that is, it dwells in our hearts and is powerfully deceptive with a life of its own. 
And finally, in order to overcome temptation, we must recognize its cause. James shows that sin is never stationary. It moves steadily in its course toward its ultimate, towards its ultimate hideous uh, end, and that is death. Sin is like a small crack in a dam. A small crack in a dam. At first, it doesn't seem threatening. But if it is not repaired quickly, it can lead to the collapse of the entire dam, causing terrible destruction. Death, in verse 15, stands in contrast to the crown of life, in verse 12. They are two totally separate destinies. At first, the two paths may seem, like, may seem just like a small fork in the road. But follow them to the end, and you are in two very different places. That is, either life or death. At the outside, at the outset, Temptation always promises excitement and fulfillment. It never comes along with the pitch. Would you like to destroy yourself and your family? Would you like to disgrace the name of your God? Rather, it comes on with the enticement. This will be fun, you know. This will meet your needs. This will get you what you have been looking for all this while. What can it hurt you to try it? Now, if you take the bait, you are on the course that leads to death. Someone has said, watch your thoughts. They become words. Watch your words. They become action. Watch your action. They become habits. Watch your habits. They become character. Watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. Allow me to close with four practical ways to overcome temptation. First, study and know ourselves. Actually, this point uh, belongs to the uh, one famous Chinese warrior uh, in his strategy, okay, um, study to know yourself. If you know yourself, you know, you can win all battles, okay. You know your enemy and you know yourself. Know where you are, know where we are vulnerable and devise strategies to protect ourselves. Others may be able to handle situations where you will fall, okay. Don't go with them if it is a source of temptation for you. Develop a deep distrust in yourself that drives you to a desperate clinging, you know, to our Lord Jesus Christ. Second, avoid tempting situation. If you are vulnerable to lust, don't go into bookstores where there is pornography. Don't have unaccountable access to the internet. If possible, if you are married, you know, always involve your spouse in your business or ministry trip. Third, have a predetermined commitment to follow Christ and to flee temptation. We have to decide this before we get into a tempting situation. Keep our love for Christ fresh and the lure of the flesh and the world will not seem so attractive to us anymore. Four, keep before us the gruesome end of temptation and that is death. Remind ourselves of that because that path will definitely, definitely lead to death at the end. 
Now this is really serious business because we will not make it as a Christian if we do not learn to overcome temptation. Recognize its source. It does not come from God, but from our own desire. Recognize its force. It dwells within us and is powerfully, powerfully deceptive with a life of its own. And third, recognize its cause. If we do not abort it, it leads us inevitably, not to life, but to death. May God help us. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you as a weak creatures, Lord. Because humanity has fallen, Lord. This sinful desire remains inside us, within us. So Lord, we want to come and ask for your help. Help us, Lord, to live a victorious life and have victory over our temptation. Help us to overcome all the temptation in our life. Lord, we know that it may come as a testing for us. We ask of God, as Jesus has taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we'll be celebrating Holy Communion. As we come to the Lord's table, let us remember what Jesus has done on the cross for us and for the people of the world. And remember his last command for us to make disciples of all nations. Let us now stand a moment of silence to confess our sin. Ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart for any known sin. And if you have fallen into temptation, confess your sin. before the Lord. Confess your sin before the Lord and you'll be clean as you come to the Lord's table. Jesus has died to give us the victory over sin and death. So take hold Take hold of it, claim on these promises, and live a victorious Christian life. Merciful Lord, we do not presume to come to your table trusting in our own righteousness but only in your abundant mercy. We are not worthy before you, for we have sinned. So with humble, lowly, and penitent hearts, we come to seek your face and favor. Let your mercy be upon us, O Lord, we pray. Amen. And now in his name, I take the common elements that we have set apart for the sacred use of our Holy Communion. And those who are joining us online, if you have prepared your elements, let us set it apart for the sacred use of our Holy Communion. According to the Holy Institution, the example and the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in remembrance of Him, we celebrate this Holy Communion. Jesus, the same night on which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, 
take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now the Lord's table is open to all Christians who truly and earnestly repent from their sin and desire God's help to live a holy life. Now, will all those who are partaking uh, this uh, your communion, will you please uh, now stand? Taking the bread, this is the body of Christ which is broken for you. Take, eat, this we do in remembrance of him. Now, taking the cup, this cup is the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ, which he shed for many for the forgiveness of our sin. Take, drink all of it in remembrance of him. Whenever we eat this bread, and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Be seated, please. Now I invite the worship team to close out with a response song. ask you to stand with us as we close.
please stand and receive the benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Be seated, please. After a moment of silent prayer and meditation, you may be dismissed. Go forth and serve the Lord. Thank mm-hmm. you.